The lives of great saints are always consecrated to the good of many. They descend on earth for no selfish reasons of their own. By knowing and following the path discovered by these great saints, one can live on this earth a life of supreme happiness. One such great saint was Sri Ramanuja, whose life, teachings and philosophy will be of immense benefit to the whole humanity. He was an unparalleled ocean of compassion, with an uncommon renunciation, dispassion, erudition, humility and steadfastness towards his chosen goal. About a thousand years ago, in a prosperous village called Sri Perungudur, there lived a pious couple by the name of Asuri Keshavacharya and Kantimati. With a desire to invoke the blessing of Sri Parthasarathi so that a child might be born to them, Asuri Keshavacharya performed Yajna at the banks of the lily lake of Parthasarathi temple at Tiruvallikeni in modern Madras. with the Yajna and the devotion of Asuri Keshavacharya couple, the Lord Parthasarathi appeared in their dream and blessed that the Lord himself will be born as their son. About a year later, on Thursday, the 12th Chitra, on the fifth day of the bright fortnight in the year 1017, Kantimati gave birth to a child who came to be known as Sri Ramanuja. This is the holy place of Sri Perangudur where Sri Ramanuja was born. It is situated at about 50 kilometers to the southwest of the modern city of Madras. Here, at this temple of Adikeshava Perumal, even today, one can see on one side of the temple courtyard, a shrine within which is seated with folded hands, the image of Sri Yatiraja, the prince among ascetics, as Ramanuja came to be known in later years. From the very childhood, Sri Ramanuja gave proofs of the prodigious powers of his intellect. As he grew up, his devotional potential too expressed themselves in the form of his great attraction for devotees. During this period, there lived a great devotee by the name of Kanchi Purna. He was an embodiment of servitude to God. One day, this great devotee of Lord Varadaraja, while passing through Sri Pirambudur, happened to meet the child Ramanuja. Struck by the devotion of Sri Ramanuja, Kanchi Purna could not consider him to be a mere human being. Notwithstanding the fact that Kanchi Purna was a man of low caste, Sri Ramanuja used to indulge in long spiritual conversation with Kanchi Purna, which both of them enjoyed. Even at this tender age, Sri Ramanuja was very clear in his conviction that caste can be no barrier in acquiring real knowledge from devotees. At the age of 16, Sri Ramanuja was wedded to an exquisitely beautiful girl by name Tanjambar. Sri Ramanuja's parents were happy to see the countenance of the new bride. Soon after, Asuri Keshavacharya left for his heavenly abode and hence the whole family had to shift to Kanchipuram. At that time, in the same holy city of Kanchipuram, lived a learned and well-renowned scholar by name Yadava Prakasa. Driven by the intense yearning for knowledge, Sri Ramanuja became his disciple. Yadava Prakasa was much pleased with the graceful appearance of his new young disciple and the luster of genius in his countenance. In a very short time, Sri Ramanuja grew to be considered the chief disciple and the great favorite. However, this could not last long. 
to Sri Ramanuja, who was an embodiment of all devotion and personification of the attitude of service to God, the expositions of Yadava Prakasha on the interpretation of the Upanishads was not pleasing. One day, while teaching Chanda Yoga Upanishad, Yadava Prakasha explained the verse which reads, Tasya yatha kapyasam pundarikam eva makshini. The eyes of the golden purusha are like two lotuses which are red like the nates of a monkey. Upon hearing this simile, tears started rolling down from the eyes of Sri Ramanuja. Yadava Prakasha wanted to know the reason for this reaction. Sri Ramanuja explained that the word kapyasam, though, could be understood to mean in three different ways, such as the lovely lotus that had just come out of the water, lotus flower standing on its stem, and lotus flower blossomed by the rays of the sun. It would be appropriate to interpret it as the eyes of that purusha are as lovely as the lotuses blossomed by the rays of the sun. Yadava Prakasha could not, however, accept this. This incident marked the beginning of Yadava Prakasha's dislike towards Sri Ramanuja. With the passage of time, Yadava Prakasha's attitude towards Sri Ramanuja changed considerably. Yadava Prakasha, not able to withstand the growing popularity of Sri Ramanuja and also his clarity of thought and expression, decided to do away with Sri Ramanuja's life under the pretext of going on a pilgrimage to the Bhagirathi river. As planned, Yadava Prakasha, along with his disciples, started on a pilgrimage and reached the foothills of the Vindhya ranges, which was a totally unfrequented place. As Yadava Prakasha was planning to execute his savage task at this place, Govinda, Sri Ramanuja's cousin and a classmate, revealed to Sri Ramanuja all that he knew of the evil designs and made Sri Ramanuja to escape from the pilgrimage group. Sri Ramanuja, fixing his mind on Lord Narayana, hastened his steps through the deep forest southwards. By evening, it became difficult for him to even move an inch due to hunger, thirst, fatigue and exhaustion. Sri Ramanuja forgot the whole world and embraced sleep to remove the pain and exhaustion. The next day, he was woken up by a hunter couple. They familiarized themselves and walked together towards the south as the hunter couple were proceeding to Rameshwaram. The wife of the hunter was feeling tired and thirsty and hence Sri Ramanuja went to bring her some water from a nearby well. with the water, the couple had disappeared. Not knowing what to do, Sri Ramanuja looked all around. To his astonishment, he found the tower of a temple. Elated by the sight of the temple, Sri Ramanuja prostrated himself. Upon inquiry, he learnt that the place was none other than Kanchipuram. Recalling the whole sequence of events, it struck Sri Ramanuja that it was only the merciful lords, the divine couple Varadaraja and his consort of Kanchipuram, who had guided and protected him in the guise of the hunter couple. He remembered the hunter's wife asking for water and hence decided to fetch water for Lord Varadaraja every day. Later, this well came to be known as Sala Kenarit. As days passed, Yadava Prakasha returned to Kanchi along with the rest of his disciples. At the sight of Sri Ramanuja, without giving an expression, he asked Sri Ramanuja to resume his studies with him. Once the princess of Kanchipuram was possessed of Brahmarakshasa, exorcists were brought from all quarters, but none could cure the princess. With great honor, Yadava Prakasha was also brought for this purpose, as he was adept in Mantra Shastra. At the sight of Yadava Prakasha, the princess burst into laughter and said to him, I know who you are and what you were in your earlier births. 
you do not know my earlier births and that the Brahma Rakshasa would not leave the princess as none of them was superior in strength on Mantra Shastra than the Brahma Rakshasa himself. The Brahma Rakshasa, however, expressed that if he has to leave the princess, Sri Ramanuja could alone command him to do that. At the behest of Yadava, Sri Ramanuja was instantly brought there. The Brahma Rakshasa, in order to get out of the princess, wanted Sri Ramanuja to graciously place his blessed feet on the head of the princess. Sri Ramanuja did so and asked the Brahma Rakshasa to quit the princess by showing a proof of having left. At this, the Brahma Rakshasa left the body of the princess, breaking the topmost branch of the neighboring tree. From that day, Sri Ramanuja became famous in the kingdom, which Yadava Prakasha did not like. Sri Ramanuja, even while being a student of Yadava Prakasha, wrote an elaborate interpretation on Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, which occurs in Taitri Upanishad. This, in fact, brought him more recognition among the erudite scholars and the elite of the society. Yadunacharya, the great Vaishnava spiritual leader at Sri Rangam, heard about the great qualities of Sri Ramanuja and developed a desire to meet him. Once he came to Kanchipuram for a darshan of Lord Varadaraja. While on his way back from the darshan and accompanied by Kanchipurna, Yamunacharya saw Sri Ramanuja in the company of his guru. Drawn by his lustre and incomparable divine beauty, Yamunacharya felt intensely attracted towards him and prayed to the Lord that through his grace, Ramanuja should become his worthy successor in propagating Vaishnavism. On yet another occasion, Sri Ramanuja could not accept the expositions on certain portions from Chanda Yoga Upanishad and Kathopanishad. Hence, he expressed his own reflections on these to his guru with due reverence to his knowledge. This acted as the last straw on the guru-disciple relationship of Yadava Prakasha and Sri Ramanuja. In furtherance to the wishes of his guru, Sri Ramanuja, after worshipping him in great humility, took leave of him and went straight to Lord Varadaraja and surrendered at his feet. Sri Ramanuja, as a result of his reverence for Kanchi Purna, spent most of his time in discussing various spiritual matters. Later, drawn by the desire to have Kanchi Purna as his guru, Sri Ramanuja implored him to take himself as his disciple. Purna, having known Yamunacharya's inner feelings and prayers to have Sri Ramanuja as his disciple, informed him that the time has now come that he should go and surrender himself to the great soul Sri Yamunacharya at Sri Rangam. The great saint Yamunacharya asked one of his disciples, Mahapurna, to bring Sri Ramanuja, whom he had earlier blessed, to Sri Rangam. However, by the time Mahapurna returned to Sri Rangam along with Sri Ramanuja, Yamunacharya had given up his body. Sri Ramanuja was shocked to hear the news and stood still before the mortal remains of the great soul with his eyes transfixed and kept gazing at the great one as if the two were exchanging thoughts. Suddenly, he noticed three fingers of Yamunacharya's right hand folded and clenched. Upon inquiry, he came to know that the fingers used to remain straight Sri Ramanuja could immediately understand the reason for the closed fingers and hence declared aloud that taking into consideration all the interpretations available, he shall write a fair commentary on the Vedas and Brahma Sutras without deviating from their traditional meanings. As an act of gratitude to the great sages Parasara and Vedavyasa, who out of compassion wrote gems among Puranas, he would name greatly learned Vaishnava after them 
so that the greatness of the sages is always recalled and remembered by the people for a long time to come. As a tribute to the Anwars, he shall arrange a commentary to be written on their hymns to enable the devotees to understand and follow the bhakti path as enshrined in the hymns. No sooner each of this was said, the fingers relaxed one by one and became straight. All were exceedingly amazed to witness this and it became clear that this young Ramanuja was going to hold the position of Yamuna Acharya in time to come. Everyone considered Sri Ramanuja as the Ekalavya of Yamunacharya. Sri Ramanuja, quite saddened at heart for not being able to see Yamunacharya alive, returned to Kanchipuram without even having a darshan of Lord Ranganatha and rededicated himself at the feet of Lord Bharadaraja. Sri Ramanuja spent most of his time in solitude and found happiness only in the company of Kanchi Purna. Sri Ramanuja never considered caste to be a barrier for gaining knowledge. One day, Sri Ramanuja called Kanchi Purna for food to his house with the intent to partake the food left out by him as prasad. Anbar, the wife of Sri Ramanuja, was much devoted to her husband and was particular about the observance of traditions and customs. She had been brought up in a family which had been strictly following the family traditions more by practice than by application of reasoning. having come to know of Sri Ramanuja's inner desire, fulfilled his word of taking food in his house by carefully avoiding Sri Ramanuja from taking the much-awaited prasad. He requested Tanjambal to serve whatever food she had prepared and after partaking it, left that house much before the appointed time. true to the observance of the family traditions, took bath for a second time, cleaned all the vessels and cooked afresh for her husband. Sri Ramanuja, knowing that Kanchi Purna could talk face to face with Lord Varadaraja, informed Kanchi Purna about the few doubts which were agitating his mind for long. Sri Kanchi Purna clarified all his doubts and as per the command of the Lord Varataraja, asked Sri Ramanuja to take refuge in Mahapurna who was a personification of virtues. At Sri Rangam, the devotees commissioned Mahapurna and his wife to leave for Kanchi Puram to bring Sri Ramanuja. As ordained by Lord Varadaraja, Sri Ramanuja proceeded to Sri Rangam to become the disciple of Mahapurna. And to the joy of both, they met each other midway at Madurantakam. This is the place Madurantakam as it looks today. Here at this place, Pancha Samskara Mandapam, Mahapurna initiated Sri Ramanuja into spiritual life. This is the insignia of the discus and conch used by Mahapurna for initiating Sri Ramanuja. Sri Ramanuja returned home with Mahapurna and his wife and requested them to stay in his house. Thereafter, Sri Ramanuja spent most of his time in studying the Prabandhas and Thiruvaimuri with Mahapurna. Punjambal was however not happy at heart 
because of her husband's utter indifference towards his household duties since his return along with Mahapurna. One day, while fetching water for their daily preparations, the pitcher in which Mahapurna's wife was drawing up the water accidentally spilled water into the pitcher Tanjambal was using. Feeling furious at this, Tanjambal let her emotions take control of her and this resulted in hurting the feelings of Mahapurna's wife. episode, Mahapurna thought it was no longer the will of Lord Narayana that they should stay at that place and forthwith left for Sri Rangam along with his wife. When Sri Ramanuja came home, he learnt all that had happened. He recalled how on an earlier occasion, Tanjambal refused food to a person seeking alms. to the agony of Sri Ramanuja and made him hasten towards taking up sannyasa. Sri Ramanuja went to the temple of Lord Varadaraja and surrendered himself at his feet. temple. As per the command of Lord Varadaraja, Sri Ramanuja was inducted into sannyasa and given the name Yeti Raja. Sri Ramanuja then accepted the Tridanda of the sannyasi as a symbol of the three realities of the universe and also of keeping the body, mind and speech under control. Everyone was surprised to hear of his sannyasa people started pouring in to see him. Since his personal endowments and erudition were well known, by ones and twos, disciples began to gather around him. Dasarathi, who was well versed in Vedas and the Vedanta, was his first disciple. Kuresa, a large-hearted young man with an incomparable and extraordinary power of memory, was his second disciple. As days passed, Yadava Prakasha, the one-time guru of Sri Ramanuja, was experiencing lack of mental peace. Upon advice of his mother and Kanchi Purna, Yadava visited Sri Ramanuja. Sri Ramanuja received Yadava Prakasha with due respect. Charmed to see the transcendental effulgence and also drawn by the modesty and grace of Sri Ramanuja, Yadava fell at his feet. Sri Ramanuja could not, however, bear this sight. Yadava Prakasha took sannyasa from Sri Ramanuja and considered himself blessed. Yadava was given the name Govinda Jhir. He was also given the title 
அருளாள பெருமாள் என்பருமானார் திருவரங்க பெருமாள் அரையர் also known as Vararanga, came to Kanjipuram to take Sri Ramanuja to Sri Rangam. He sang various devotional songs in front of Lord Varadaraja. As the Lord was pleased with the divine songs, Vararanga begged for Sri Ramanuja and the Lord granted his prayers. Thus, even the service to God by their devotees was decided by the Lord himself. Having accomplished his special mission, Vararanga brought Sri Ramanuja to the feet of Sri Ranganatha. Lord Ranganatha bestowed on Sri Ramanuja two mystic powers. The power to assuage maladies of the sufferers and to protect the devotees of God. Endowed with these powers, Sri Ramanuja began to shine with celestial beauty. At Sri Rangam, Sri Ramanuja studied various scriptures under Mahapurna and studied the depths of Prabandhams. Mahapurna advised Sri Ramanuja that in order to learn the real meaning of Charama Shloka, he can approach the great pious scholar Tirukottiur Nambi, also called as Goshti Purna, living in a nearby village called Tirukottiur. This is the village of Tirukottiur as it exists today, where the houses were the idols of Goshtipurna and Sri Ramanuja facing each other in the presence of Lord Narasimhamurti and the nearby temple reminds everyone passing that way of the interesting episode that happened about a thousand years ago. As per the wishes of Mahapurna, Sri Ramanuja left for Tirukottiur and met Goshtipurna. After worshipping his feet, he submitted his request regarding learning of the real meaning of Charama Shloka. Goshtipurna turned down his request and asked him to come some other day. In this way, he was refused 17 times. The people of the village were moved by the devotion of Sri Ramanuja, who had been earnest in his quest for learning. At the 18th time, Goshtipurna, pleased with the yearning of Sri Ramanuja for the real knowledge, revealed to him the meaning of the Charama Shloka. Later, on seeing that Sri Ramanuja's thirst for real knowledge had not been quenched, Goshtipurna, after taking several oaths from Sri Ramanuja, explained to him the sacred Ashtakshari Mantra. To all this, the Lord Narasimhamurti was the witness. Goshtipurna cautioned Sri Ramanuja that he should not reveal the mantra to anyone as whoever hears this will be blessed and benefited in this world as well as the eternal world and attain divine bliss. No sooner he learnt the sacred mantra, he came out of the house and climbed the top of the temple tower and in a mighty voice called for the people as he addressed the gathering already waiting for him. Sri Ramanuja, the incarnation of Lakshmana, the only knower of the innermost feelings of the heart of Yamuna Muni, the master of both the superhuman powers, the dispeller of afflictions, the beloved of all people, the ocean of the cream of kindness, the sun that destroys darkness of despair. Pronounced in a stentorian voice from the depths of his joyful heart, the great mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. The whole earth appeared sacred as the large gathering of people joined Sri Ramanuja in repeating the mantra. In the meantime, 
Ashtipurna came to know of whatever had happened and grew extremely angry. On seeing Sri Ramanuja, Goshtipurna poured his heart out. In all humility, Sri Ramanuja replied, Revered sir, according to your words, whoever might hear the said mantra is sure to attain the highest end of life. If an insignificant creature like me goes to hell and thousands of men and women are thereby enabled to go to Vaikuntha, that is exactly what I pray for. Such was the greatness of the large-hearted Sri Ramanuja, who cared more for the sufferings of the people than of his own. The reasoned and sweet words of Sri Ramanuja rendered the countenance of his Guru free from the slightest trace of anger. On realizing his own narrowness and the supreme magnanimity of Sri Ramanuja, Goshtipurna embraced him in deep devotion and named him Emberumanar. Sri Ramanuja, being a personification of modesty, exclaimed to his Guru that the mantra had attained such great power only because it emanated from the mouth of such a blessed person as Goshtipurna himself, and that Sri Ramanuja, despite having transgressed the behest of the Guru, had become eternally blessed by receiving Goshtipurna's embrace, which even gods might envy. continued his pursuit towards obtaining proficiency from various scriptures. He also obtained perfection of knowledge by studying under Sri Bararanga and Thirumale Andan. Trained by each and all of the great five, namely Kanchi Purna, Mahapurna, Goshti Purna, Vararanga and Thirumale Andan, Sri Ramanuja became as it were the second manifestation of Sri Yamunacharya for the great sage was present in five parts in these five great souls. Now these five parts were made to one in the frame of Sri Ramanuja. Sri Ramanuja by his actions showed to the world how he had reverence for his gurus and how much he valued the teachings that emanated from the mouth of his gurus. On the other hand, he took all efforts in grooming his disciples, taking the right path of devotion, obedience and service to God. He could draw afflicted souls, souls burnt in flames of worldly miseries to the feet of God and remove all their miseries. That is why he was called Ubhaya Vibhutipati, by now, the devotion and patronage of all people in Sri Rangam, high and low, started going towards Sri Ramanuja, and the people started looking upon him with great reverence. Sri Ramanuja took into his possession the keys of the temple of Sri Ranganatha. He made a lot of reforms in the functioning and administration of Sri Rangam temple. He brought forth refinement in the puja procedures that was being followed in order to ensure that each individual did his job without any lapse on his part he introduced many regulatory measures without dislocating the priests and the staff the high priest of the Sri Rangam temple grew jealous over this and by hook or crook decided to get rid of Sri Ramanuja 
Sri Ramanuja used to take alms from seven houses in a day and live by eating such food thus collected. Hence, the high priest one day hatched a plan to kill him by offering poisoned food to him through one of the houses where he would seek alms. Even though the plan was executed with fine precision, the heart of the wife of the head priest who offered the alms was moved with pity at the sight of the guileless face and transcendental beauty of Sri Ramanuja. She broke forth into tears and touched his feet. At this, Sri Ramanuja grew suspicious and threw far the alms collected, as saints are forbidden from taking alms given with tears. having failed, the head priest hatched up yet another plan. Sri Ramanuja was in the habit of going to the temple every day. On one such occasion, the head priest gave him the water that was used for the ablution of the deity after mixing poison. when the head priest saw him in his routines with his usual celestial beauty and superhuman luster, the head priest felt guilty for his evil thoughts and deeds. He fell at the feet of Sri Ramanuja and sought his pardon. The great-hearted Sri Ramanuja embraced the head priest and prayed to Lord Ranganatha to pardon the head priest for his misdeeds. Sri Ramanuja started out of Sri Rangam on pilgrimage and on route Kanchipuram reached Tirumalai. Sri Ramanuja decided not to climb the hill with his foot and defile it as the whole hill was considered the incarnation of Adi Sesha. The sadhus and ascetics heard of Sri Ramanuja's resolve not to climb the hill out of the respect he had for it. They implored him to change his resolve as this might prompt the common man also to behave in such a way, thereby depriving the Lord from the visit of devotees. Accepting the entreaties of high souls as a command, fixing his mind at the Lord's lotus feet, Sri Ramanuja decided to climb the hill with his hands and crawled till the top of the first hill. Sri Ramanuja, in order to fulfill his promise made to Yamuna Muni on writing commentary on Brahma Sutra, was preparing himself for the task. While doing so, Sri Ramanuja wanted to have the help of Bodhaya Navritti, which was being preserved with great care at Sharada Peetham in Kashmir. Bodhayana was the great disciple of the sage Vyasa. He had an in-depth understanding of the inner meanings of Brahma Sutra. Hence, the need of Bodhaya Navritti as a reference material for writing the commentary was immense. Sri Ramanuja started studying the Vritti day and night along with his disciple Kuresa. Sri Ramanuja, with the help of Kuresa, completed writing the commentary which was named Sri Bhashya. Tradition says that while Sri Ramanuja was in Kashmir, Goddess Sharada Devi appeared before him and asked him to explain his exposition of the mantra Kapya Sampundari Ka Kram. The goddess, overwhelmed with the lucidity and clarity of the exposition, gave Sri Ramanuja the title Bhashyakara. Sri Ramanuja also wrote certain invaluable books like Vedanta Deepam, Vedanta Sara, Vedanta Sangraha and Gita Bhashya. After he finished writing Sri Bhashya and other works, Sri Ramanuja, along with numerous disciples and followers, set out on spiritual campaign of conquest. Entering the kingdom of the Cholas, he travelled to the Pandya kingdom, Kerala, and moving northwards, passed through Dwaraka, Mathura, Brindavan, and other places, including Badrinath and Muktinath, and reached Kashmir. On his way back, he reached Tirupati. There, he found there was a certain amount of uncertainty over the nature of the presiding deity there. Thereupon, he convinced the people 
that the Lord present there was none other than Lord Lakshmi Narayana. He quoted evidence from Puranas and Prabandhas to establish the fact. Further, he gave discourse at Tirupati on the Upanishads. These discourses later came to be known as Vedanta Sangraha. Tradition has it that Kuresa's wife, as a result of partaking the consecrated food of Lord Ranganatha, which was sent to them by the command of the Lord himself, gave birth to twin sons. Sri Ramanuja, the knower of the past, present and the future, named them Parasara Bhattar and Vyasa Bhattar. Through his supreme powers, Sri Ramanuja could see that the sons of Kuresa were the children best suited to be named after the great sages Parasara and Vyasa. At a later date, after Sri Ramanuja left his body, Parasara became the successor of Sri Ramanuja in carrying out his mission. One day, at the time of the Garuda festival at Sri Rangam, a handsome man with broad shoulders was walking along with an exquisitely beautiful large-eyed lady. All his mind, heart and looks were so fixed on her that he was not conscious of the rest of the world. In his hands, he held fans which moved to and fro to her benefit. As Sri Ramanuja was returning by the same way after worship, his eyes fell on the strange sight. Sri Ramanuja sent for the man and upon inquiry, learnt that he was Dhanurdasa and the lady was Hemamba. Dhanurdasa had been protecting the most beautiful, bewitching eyes of that lady only because he had not found any other eyes more beautiful than hers. Sri Ramanuja was astonished at the devotion of Dhanurdasa. Upon Sri Ramanuja confirming that he could show more beautiful eyes than that of Hemamba, Dhanurdasa assured that he would then adore them. Sri Ramanuja took Dhanurdasa to Lord Ranganatha and showed him in the light of the camphor flame the two large lotus eyes of the Lord. Dhanurdasa could not turn his eyes away and tears started flowing from his eyes and he experienced supreme beatitude. After regaining outward consciousness, Dhanurdasa and Hemamba fell at the feet of Sri Ramanuja, the boundless ocean of mercy who graciously freed both of them from the darkness of delusion. One day, Mahapurna had set fire to the dead body of a devotee who was a Chandala by caste. When Sri Ramanuja with all reverence wanted to know why he did so, Mahapurna drew analogy with certain happenings in Sri Rama's life and said that he was neither greater than Lord Rama nor was the devotee lower than Jatayu. Even though Sri Rama could not light the pyre for his father Dasaratha, he had taken all pains to cremate Jatayu by himself because of his being a great devotee. At that time, the Chola kingdom was undergoing a spiritual turmoil. The king, Kulotunga Choran, was trying to make all the people accept the doctrine of the spiritual faith and follow the path of worship prescribed thereunder. Therefore, Sri Ramanuja decided to find his way out of Sri Rangam. After an arduous journey, Sri Ramanuja reached Yadavadri, otherwise known as Tirunarayanapuram. The present name of this place is Melakkotte. This is Melakkotte as it exists today, with a well-structured temple within which is seated the Lord Tirunarayanan. Here, Sri Ramanuja stayed for almost 12 years. Sri Ramanuja loved this place specially because of the abundant availability of white earth with which Sri Vaishnavas put the divine mark on the forehead. Tradition says that Sri Ramanuja, while taking a stroll in the Tulsi grove, came across an image underneath an ant hill. The image was that of Tirunarayanan and was lifelike and had captivating features. With the king's patronage, Sri Ramanuja founded here a great temple for Tirunarayanan. One 
one day, Lord Tirunarayanan appeared in the dream of Sri Ramanuja and told him that there is no Utsava Vigraha for him. And hence, he has not been able to go out of the temple and bless his devotees. And asked Sri Ramanuja to bring at an early date his mobile deity, which was with a Muslim emperor. Being thus commanded, Sri Ramanuja set out on his mission immediately. As he reached the emperor's palace, he was received warmly by the emperor, who granted Sri Ramanuja's request. The emperor had in his possession many deities which were removed on various occasions from different temples. Not able to identify the Utsava Vigraha, Sri Ramanuja, who was assigned this task by the God himself, placing his mind at the feet of the Lord, called out, Selva Pilleva, meaning thereby, Please come, Sampat Kumara. To everybody's amazement, Sampat Kumara came and sat on the lap of Sri Ramanuja. Sri Ramanuja, without losing time, took leave of the emperor and started his journey back to Melakote along with Sampat Kumara. The daughter of the emperor loved the beauty of the image. Her love was so much that it solemnized into bhakti. As the princess could not withstand the separation of her from Sampat Kumara, she started in search of her beloved idol. Her sustained efforts brought about the union she was longing for. The princess reached Melakkote. Sri Ramanuja and his disciples were amazed to see her devotion. As Sampat Kumara was installed much before the arrival of the princess in a secret spot inside the temple, the princess decided to spend the remaining days of her life at Melakkote, enjoying the bliss born out of communion with Lord of her heart and ultimately became one with him. The princess ceased to identify the self with the body and so had no fetters of caste or religion. In the body alone are found name, caste and religion. In fact, till this day, the sacred image of the princess is being worshipped in all Vaishnavite temples as Bibi Natyar. Earlier, many low caste people had helped Sri Ramanuja to bring in safety the image of Sampat Kumara to Melakote. Hence, at the temple of Tirunarayanapuram, the low caste people were given the right to enter the temple for three days every year. One can imagine the extent of revolution it would have been when about a thousand years ago, Sri Ramanuja in his own way established that to a true devotee, caste can be no bar. Sri Ramanuja's concern for the people extended beyond the scope of caste and religion. He also took keen interest in their social well-being. During the period of his stay at Melakote, there was acute problem for water and hence all those living in that area were in great distress. In order to alleviate their misery, Sri Ramanuja organized for construction of a tank which was called Moti Talab. Sri Ramanuja was to leave Melakote after staying for 12 years. The devotees were sorely afflicted by the thought of separation which was to follow. Sri Ramanuja, moved by the devotion of the devotees, organized for an image of himself to be made. And after transmitting his powers, he handed it over to the devotees, stating that they would get the spiritual inspiration from the image as much as they got from himself. This image at Melakote is called Tamar Uganda Tirumeni. It is said that once during the year 2500 BC, at the beginning of Kali Yuga, Andal prayed to the Lord Sundarabahu that if Sri Ranganatha would graciously accept her hand, she would offer a hundred jars of sweet rice, a karavadisal, with milk, and hundred jars of butter along with other delicacies. The Lord 
fulfill this prayer of Andal. While studying the Prabandhas of Alvar, Sri Ramanuja found that Andal could not fulfill her word. Therefore, he took upon himself this task, which he completed with all devotion. Soon, he left for Srivalliputtu, the birthplace of Andal, to inform her that her oath had been fulfilled. Tradition says that here Andal called Sri Ramanuja Anna for his act befitting a brother. Thereafter, Sri Ramanuja came to be known as Koil Anna. While Sri Ramanuja was staying at Sri Rangam, the devotees at Sri Perambudu, the birthplace of Sri Ramanuja, made an image of him and invoking life in it, according to the Vedic rites, installed it inside a huge temple. Sri Ramanuja could know all that was happening at Sri Perambudur even while being at Sri Rangam. Captivated by the devotion of the people at his native place, he transmitted some of his powers into the image there. As he did this out of his own will, the image came to be known as Tan Ugarnda Tirumeni. As per the will of the Lord, the large-hearted incarnation of Lakshmana, Bhagavan Srimat Ramanujacharya, the Ubhya Vibhutipati, grew indrawn and silent in preparation to enter the Supreme Realm. Sri Ramanuja, before entering the Supreme Realm of God, transmitted his own power into an image of his by breathing into the crown of the head. As he transformed all his powers into this image, it came to be known as Tanana Tirumeni. Around noon on Saturday, the tenth day of the bright half of the month of Maha in the year 1137, Sri Ramanuja entered into the supreme realm of the feet of Lord Vishnu. After sanctifying the earth for the good and the happiness of many for 120 years, Sri Ramanuja made this world an abode of happiness like Vaikuntha. He gave gems of instructions by which the devotees could enjoy happiness and peace, not only in this life, but also in lives to come. Sakshan man madha man madha yamana Madhu madhana vijaya thoodira yugalam poli naitthu vaitta Kanaikkal ghalum